Shalom everyone, my name is Medin Shachar and I am an educator at the Ghetto Fighters House Museum. Today's program is going to explore humor in the context of the Holocaust, humor during the Holocaust and in the aftermath of one of humanity's darkest moments. The Ghetto Fighters House and our CEO, Egal Cohen, who is with us this evening or this morning or this afternoon, are honored to have Fern Perlstein and Dr. Lee Steyer leave me with us today in a conversation about Fern's movie, The Last Laugh, a springboard for such a delicate subject. I hope that our audience has taken advantage of the free screening of the movie and all are invited to watch the movie until tomorrow morning, Israel time. So before we start, I would like to introduce our very knowledgeable guests. Fern Perlstein is a prize-winning cinematographer, writer, director, and editor whose work has won numerous awards and been screened and broadcast around the world. A member of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Picture Arts and Sciences, the Brooklyn Jewish Hall of Fame, and one of the few women in Kodak's on film ad campaign, Fern has collaborated with some of the biggest names in documentary, including numerous Oscar nominated filmmakers, winner of the Sundance Cinematography Prize for Ramona Diaz's Imelda. She has directed, produced, and or photographed around the world, from Japan to Haiti, to Uganda, to Guana, to Burma, where she snuck her 16 millimeter camera into the rebel bases of the Karen Liberation Army. Fern has graduate degrees in documentary from the International Center of Photography and Stanford University. Since her first student film at Sundance, she's had four features premiere at the Taribeka Film Festival, most recently the critically acclaimed The Last Laugh screened at over 100 festivals, released in over 25 cities. Today, this bold and timely documentary film continues to screen around the world as Pearlstein and partner Robert Edwards have become recognized speakers on humor as it relates to the Holocaust, anti-Semitism, racism, and most recently, COVID-19. And now for uh, our second guest, Dr. Liat Steyer Livni. She is an assistant professor, senior lecturer in the Department of Cultural Studies, Creation and Production at Sapir College, and a tutor and course coordinator for the Cultural Studies MA program in the Department of Literature, Language, and the Arts at the Open University of Israel. Her research focuses on the changing commemoration of the Holocaust in Israel from the 1940s until present day. It combines Holocaust studies, memory studies, cultural studies, trauma studies, and film studies. She has authored numerous articles and five books, among them Two Faces in the Mirror from 2009 in Hebrew that analyzes the representation of Holocaust survivors in Israeli cinema. Is it okay to laugh about it? From 2017, a book that analyzes Holocaust humor, satire, and parody in Israeli culture and more recently, Remaking Holocaust Memory 2019 that analyzes documentary cinema by third generation survivors in Israel. In 2019, she won the Young Scholar Award given jointly by the Association for Israel Studies and the Israel Institute. And together, both Fern and Liat contributed chapters to the newly released book, Laughter After, Humor and the Holocaust, released by Wayne State University Press in April 2020. This book argues that humor performs political, cultural, and social functions in the wake of horror, examining what is at stake in deploying humor in representing the Holocaust, namely, what are the boundaries? Both the movie The Last Laugh and this book come at an important moment in the trajectory of Holocaust memory. As the generation of survivors continue to dwindle, there's a great concern among scholars and community leaders about how memories of the Holocaust will be passed to future generations. I am sure that today's program will add to our knowledge and present new insights. Uh, we're going to start with the official trailer of the movie. So I will now say, enjoy the program. Two Jews have been sent to assassinate Hitler. The doctor arrives, and who is it? It's Dr. Mengele. Oh my God, that's awful and hilarious. It's awful hilarious. 
Subjects come up that are seemingly inappropriate for comedy, and that's the place that's the most interesting to explore. You don't want to walk out on stage and go, let's talk about Auschwitz. No one's getting laid after that show. Are there things that go over the line? Yeah, I'm sure that there are. If I was standing online naked for the gas chambers, would I hold my stomach in? Whoa! <laughs> Humor healed us. My mother would laugh like I never saw her laugh. The Holocaust is not funny, but survival, there can be humor in that. That was how my mother spoke. Mm -hmm. For you, I lived through Hitler, you can't make the bed. Without humor, I don't think we would have survived. Did you talk about how funny the camp was? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> we laughed to say, ha, 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 you'll get you there. It's much more fun to laugh than not to laugh. By ridiculing the Nazis, he was taking away their power. You're ashamed that you laughed at it, but you're laughing because it's like you can't help yourself. Just because it's uncomfortable doesn't mean that it's the wrong thing. Comics have to tell us who we are, where we are, even if it's in bad taste. It's important to talk about things that are taboo. Otherwise, they just stay in this dark place and they become dangerous. You cannot live in the shadow. I enjoy life. Could Hitler imagine that I will survive and have three great-grandchildren? I mean, that's my revenge. <laughs> It was funny. Okay, so thank you very much and hello everyone. Um, as you can all be uh, understand, we're dealing tonight with a very sensitive and complex uh, subject, topic, the uh, Holocaust humor. And when we talk about Holocaust humor, and before we turn to Fern, just a couple of words about this sensitive and complex topic. First of all, when we talk about Holocaust humor, we cannot talk about it as a phenomenon until the late 80s. I mean, in the few decades after the Holocaust, Holocaust humor was almost a taboo. Meaning there were some films made about it. We all heard about the great dictator or to be another being, and of course the producers, they're all mentioned in the film. But they were unique. These were rare films and it was not a phenomenon. What was, in my opinion, a watershed moment in a cultural atmosphere of Holocaust and Holocaust humor is when Mouse was published in 1987. Mouse by Art Spiegelman is the first graphic novel to discuss Holocaust when integrating Holocaust humor. What Art Spiegelman did is introduce the story of his father, Vladek, a Holocaust survivor, in a story of cats and mice and of course, the mice were Jews, the cats were Nazis, they were called Nazis, and uh, Art also discussed the life of himself as a second generation Holocaust survivor living in the shadow. Now, at first, we're a bit uh, shun away from the topic, how dare he deal with Holocaust with humor and integrate Holocaust humor and so on, but very quickly he received raving great reviews and Afterwards, in 1992, Mouse 2 was published, and he was the first um, graphic novel to win a Pulitzer Prize for his author. And this has changed the way the world, the Western world, looks upon Holocaust humor. And you can see that from the 90s, especially in the 2000s, you can talk about Holocaust humor as a phenomenon, meaning you can find it everywhere. There are hundreds and hundreds of texts that include Holocaust humor. You can find it in in books, you can find it in poetry, in cinema, of course, in internet memes, in social media, and so on, you can find it everywhere. Now, within the cinematic world, there were many films that dealt with Holocaust humor, but they didn't deal with it as a phenomenon. You know, to deal with such a complex subject, to walk into the lion's den, to do something so courageous, it needed a really special woman to do it, and here came this special woman, and this is Fern, and her uh, film, The Last Laugh, is groundbreaking in this sense because this is the first film that provides a comprehensive outlook on the phenomenon, meaning it asks all the tough questions. And in my opinion, it's beauty that it doesn't give explicit answers, but it leaves the viewers to contemplate on the topic and everyone can give their own answers to the questions and maybe there aren't any answers at all. So Fern, let's begin by talking the, about the initiative to direct the film. What drove you to deal with such a complex topic which many others hesitated to deal with before? Well, um, well, uh, thank you for all having me, first of all. Um, and thank you for the nice intro. 
the it's funny that you should bring up Mouse because that's really at the heart of where the the idea of this film came from. I was with a friend in Miami and they had just uh, opened the Holocaust Memorial. I believe it was 1990. And we, he and my friend and I were there and we had both read Mouse and loved it. And there, we were guided by this elderly survivor. And at the end of it, we got into a conversation with her about Mouse. And as you say, you know, uh, it was essentially the first graphic novel, let alone the first graphic novel to win, go on to win a Pulitzer Prize. So there had been nothing like it. So when we asked her about it, she, you know, the, the woman got very angry and said, you know, there's nothing funny about the Holocaust. You can't cover it in the funny pages because it, to her, she only knew, saw it as a comic, a comic strip that you would see in the Sunday newspaper. So we went on to have a very you know, thoughtful conversation with her about how we didn't think, yes, it used this comic form, but we didn't think it was funny per se. I mean, what might have been funny was the, the modern relationship with his father, but nothing ever in the camps were made fun of at all. And we had a very interesting conversation. And then my friend and I went our separate ways to grad school and in the, in the process, he started thinking about this idea, like, was it okay? It, were there examples? And he went on to write this academic paper, a 25 page paper that, you know, researched the, the, the humor that existed in the camps, in the ghettos, in the DP camps. And, um, and in fact, there were so many examples. So I saw, I ran into him again in 1993 and he handed me the paper and he said, make this into a movie. That's, it was called The Last Laugh. I, I read the paper. I knew immediately that I would make it, but I knew that I would open it up to post-war post -war humor because that was so much, you know, a part of it. And, you know, it took me until 1993 to, till I could get the money was, it was so controversial as you can imagine. We finally raised the money in 2011. So, oh. And, and I, will, I will say this, that my husband, who is my filmmaking partner, in 1998, we met because he had hired me to shoot a film of his. And then we went on to make almost every film together. And we decided then we were going to work really hard to get, the, to get The Last Laugh made. And it was right before um, Roberta Benigni's, uh, uh, why am I spacing, um, film. Life is beautiful. Yeah. Life is beautiful. Thank you. Um, and so we, we, we decided to pull back from trying very hard then because the whole conversation would have been about that movie. You know, it was such a phenomenon. It was such a shock for that film to come out. So we stepped back and, but every couple of years we try again and try again. And it was just very difficult as you can imagine. Yeah, I believe stepping out, it was a great idea because how costumer is not only about life is beautiful, it's so much more and concentrating only about life is beautiful is, is too little. It doesn't dis begin to describe the, the phenomenon. But how did you choose the interview? Is uh, were the comedians that refused to take a part in it? How did you decide who to let in? Yeah, so, um, you know, the benefit of having 1993 till 2011 to make the film is I had done tons of research. I was so ready so that when somebody finally came in with the money, I was ready to go. But uh, so when we got the money, we had a list of a hundred comedians that we wanted to interview. But at the very top were the people we felt we couldn't make the film without. So Mel Brooks, Sarah Silverman, and Joan Rivers, who we were supposed to interview, but she got, she got sick two weeks before our interview. That's another story. But um, uh, she, so when people ask me, did anybody say no? I joke that everybody said no. And it just was a matter of how many times I would go back and find ways to convince them or whatever. And like with someone like Mel Brooks, we were advised, well, if you get these five people, then you can ask it. You know, there were all different ways and Actually, once we did that, he, he was able to be convinced to do it. The hardest pers person for us to get was Sarah Silverman. 
And mainly because it, we really couldn't, you, you know, with this film, everybody, it didn't matter how much I tried to convince people, oh, it's gonna be, you can trust me, it's gonna be tasteful. Nobody knew how an audience would react to this film. So it was hard to get to Sarah because we couldn't get past her people, you know? I think, you know, we never really knew. But finally, and I remember, you know, she, her, she has a manager who she's very close with and very protective of her. And we couldn't seem to get it. And then my husband's a screenwriter. And so we went to, they share an agency and we went to them and said, can you ask Sarah? And he said, I, I can't go above the manager, her own agent. So he said, the, so he said, well, what do we do? If we can't get to the manager, what, what, what do you suggest? He said, the only other person she will answer to is Mel Brooks. So I said, oh, like I could just call Mel Brooks up on the phone and say, hey, can you do me a favor? But unbelievably so. We had already edited that piece with them where they are sparring back and forth and she does the, his AFI benefit, you know, where she makes the joke about, you know, him dying, which is dark, dark, dark. Anyway, we send that to him. And I, I say, is there any way you can help us with this? And he wrote her the next day and said, I don't do much, but I thought this was worth doing. Look how good, at, look how good we are in it together. Do it if you want and, and don't if you don't want. And the next day she said, yes. Wow, amazing. Yeah. yeah. And after this success in persuading everyone to come along, what were your main topics? I mean, when you decide to touch on such a complex subject and there are so many subgenres you can, you know, deal with, how did you approach this theme? Well, okay, so when my friend handed me that paper and I knew, okay, I'm gonna have this Greek chorus of comedians. I also knew I needed a personal story that was gonna, you know, touch people, you know, and make it okay for people. So I didn't know what that was and I struggled for years trying to figure it out. And, and when I, so what happened was we got the money, we took this list to Bob's agent and said, is there, a, okay, look, we have money. Is there anyone on this list you can get to do it? We wanna, we wanna, film and so let me let me get back to you and he called back 15 minutes later and he said Rob Reiner said he'll do it a week from Wednesday which meant we went from nothing we didn't have a crew we were in New York he was in LA we had nothing except the research and, and wanting to do it for so long and then I thought well I can't go you know, I have a, I'm not going to spend this money to go and shoot one interview. I have to do more. So we got, because it, that was such a powerful get to have Rob Reiner, a couple other comedians said yes, but that, that other story, that personal story, I had to get it. So one of the people that I had re, du, found in my research was this woman, Hanala, uh, Hanala Stadner, who was, who's known now as Hanala Sagal. She, um, wrote a book called My Parents Went Through the Holocaust and all I got out of it was this lousy t-shirt. So I called her and I said, will you be in the film I'm coming to LA? She said, absolutely. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I wasn't asking her for that personal story, but I was also on, in addition to the comedians and finding that story, I really wanted to find, you know, survivors who either thought it was okay to laugh but also thought it wasn't okay. Like I really thought that was an important aspect of the film. So when I was talking to her, she said, I have the perfect mother and daughter for you. You know, the daughter started second generation Los Angeles, you know, uh, Clara Firestone and her mother goes around the world talking about the Holocaust and they have a great sense of humor. And, you know, she told me all these things and I said, oh my, I have to talk to them. And I got on the phone with them you know, in the next 15 minutes. And I knew that was the story I was looking for. I could tell right from our first conversation. And I'm not sure I answered your question, but you know. Yeah, yeah, I okay. guess. Okay. <laughs> so before we talk about red lines, Itai, can we please watch uh, clip number five? To people who say, don't make these jokes because they're in the wrong hands, like whose hands are right? If comics can't point out what's ridiculous in the world 
and the tragic in this world, who else is going to point it out? Here's someone who's not Jewish. Okay. Lisa Lampanelli at the David Hasselhoff roast. David Hasselhoff is a legend! A giant in television and music. David, your singing is huge in Germany. If they had played your music in Auschwitz, the Jews would have sprinted for those ovens. I don't think it's funny. I think the initial reaction is when a non-Jew makes a Holocaust joke uh, that they're making fun of the Holocaust. And who are you to make fun of that? You weren't there. You weren't affected, okay? We were, and we're allowed to joke about it, okay? Um, just like um, African Americans uh, are allowed to, to say certain words that, God forbid, a big Jew from Long Island, if I said it, I'd get my ass in trouble. Jews have their turf, gay people have their turf, black people have their turf, and when people transgress those turfs, you can run into problems. I ain't never been in the barber shop and heard a bunch of brothers talking about Jews. Black people don't hate Jews, black people hate white people. <laughs> we don't got time to dice white people up in the little groups. I hate everybody. I have a really hard time deciding who's gonna get offended by what. Culture shifts and the words or the taboo subject shifts as well. It's no longer a taboo. You can make fun of Lincoln's assassination. You can make fun of the crucifixion. You can't make fun of Muhammad. That's still, that's still a taboo subject, you know? And you see, there are and that's truly a tra taboo subject because if you do make fun of it, there's a good chance someone's gonna throw a bomb through your window like the Danish cartoonist. Okay, so a non-Jew telling a Holocaust joke and afterwards Mel Brooks himself said, I can't go there, meaning you can't joke about the survivors, but Sarah Silverman says that you can joke about it. So do you believe there must be a line one shouldn't cross, or where do you draw the line if there is a line, in your opinion? Well, I will just say that I think it was very brave to start with that clip, because, you know, there's a build-up, right? There's like, this is the okay humor, this is what we're all comfortable with, this is what the, 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 the gallows humor that the that the survivors themselves use. You, you went, you know, like, like without yeah. that context or for people who haven't seen the film, there is a tasteful way in. And by the time Renee is watching that joke with Lisa Lampanelli, where it finally crosses her line, that's where you, you took us to. So um, uh, do me a favor and repeat the question just so I can yeah. Do you do you believe there is a, a line. line? There should a be line. a line. I think that most people have a line. I mean, I, I I most comedians have a line. Most, you know, humans with empathy have a line. I personally had a line. I mean, I always joke that the only person that didn't have a line was Gilbert Gottfried because nothing. He's not afraid to say anything or offend anybody. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, my line was, were those jokes that you hear on the playground, for instance, where, you know, what's the difference between a pizza and a Jew? A Jew doesn't, you know, pizza doesn't scream when you put it in the oven. I mean, I actively did not use those jokes because I didn't think they furthered the discussion. I, um, I just think they're mean-spirited. And so that's not the film I wanted to make. I wanted to show that, you know, some of these some of these jokes are for healing, are for, you know, little revolutionary acts. But, you know, once they're just mean-spirited, because intent has a big thing for me. So that's where I personally drew the line. I mean, we almost, we almost broke my own rule because when I was filming, so let me back up to say that another thing I believe is that it's context. Who's, who's telling the joke? Who's watching the joke? I mean, about gosh, 15, 18 years ago, my husband and I went to see, uh, this is while I was trying to make the film, but it was off in the distance, uh, way off in the distance. We went to see Sarah Silverman's show, Jesus is Magic, which is earlier scenes you see Renee, the survivor in the film, watching these clips on YouTube. And I saw it as a much younger version of myself in a black box small theater in the West Village. And, you know, she did about 20 minutes of Holocaust humor. 
And it was very, very funny. We were all laughing. There were no eyes on me. I, you know, this was a topic that I had already been researching and, and whatnot. And then I had decided, well, what's the context? You know, I wanted my audience to start watching that joke, start laughing at that joke and pull out and see a 90 something year old survivor watching the joke. And it's funny because a lot of the young people I would have screenings for would say, you got to take that out. I, I don't want her to, you know, she's, she's spoiling my buzz or whatever. And I was like, but that's the point, right? Context. You need to know what you're laughing at. And that was very important to me. So um, in the wrong hands, these jokes are very dangerous. And that's, of course, what people are most afraid of when it comes to Holocaust jokes, right? The, in the wrong hands that if someone like Sarah Silverman, who is genius at sort of playing this, this naive girl who's being racist or anti-Semitic, but it's an act and she's being ironic, well, some people might not see that irony. You know, some people may just see it for what it sounds like and it's not okay. So um, it's very, very complicated and that's the fear that, um, you know, that then that joke is then retold by somebody who's not a comedian. That's not, you know, telling it to the audience, to our audience, they're telling it to a, you know, an anti-Semitic audience or, so that, that, is, that is the fear and the complication. Right, and you talked about build-up, but in my opinion, when you shock the audience to begin with, then everything else goes smoothly. And from here on, it's just a smooth sail. And talking about smooth sail, and just to make a fern relax, of course, if you haven't watched the film, the film discusses many uh, subgenres of Holocaust humor. And one of the main topics which research was uh, afraid to touch upon until the 2000s is Holocaust humor within the ghettos and the camps. And I was amazed to find out that the academics have only dared touching on the subject in the last 20 years. And even so, even then, they did it with great fear, um, fearing that their uh, books would be misunderstood, that somebody will, might think that they uh, chip in the Holocaust or laugh at the survivor's expense and so on, which of course was not true. And in the last 20 years, we have found out, that especially in the last 20 years, that there was Holocaust humor told by the Jewish victims in the ghettos, in the concentration camps, and they used it as a defense mechanism, as a very important defense mechanism. And Itai, if you can please uh, show uh, number two, the, uh, clip number two, it will all be much clearer. N number two and number three? Two. Okay. Just one second. <laughs> three three five Ghetto Diary, October twenty ninth, nineteen forty one. Every day at the art cafe on Keshno Street, one can hear songs and satires, and the police and even the Gestapo. The typhus epidemic itself is the subject of jokes. The typhus is a subject of jokes. It is laughter through tears, but it is laughter. This is our only weapon in the ghetto. Our the only weapon in the ghetto. The Nazi decrees. Life at the death. Humor is the only thing the Nazis cannot understand. And that's the only thing understand. the Nazis cannot understand. Humor. Humor is the only thing they don't understand. They don't understand life either. Humor is a way of dealing with an unbearable reality. It's a way of protesting. Uh, it's a way of sometimes of keeping your dignity when you have to do things that you don't want to do. So if you do them, but you keep your humor, it's like saying, you know, I'm still human. By me, best to shame, cela signifie vous êtes pour moi plus que la vie. That's all you're gonna hear. I met Robert <laughs> Clary. I spoke a little French, so he, he was very happy because he, he wasn't that proficient in English in 1952. He was getting better, and now he's he speaks it as if he really knows it. Robert Clary was in the camps, and he would he would entertain in the camps, and the entertainment saved his life. That was second nature with me, singing, dancing, clowning around. 
And uh, that helped me tremendously when I was deported. Because uh, automatically, when I went, even the first camp, I, I started to think for, for, for the, the, the people who were there, the, 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 the prisoners. People are constant, consistent. And uh, if you're funny, and if you're funny before, you'll be funny during, and you'll be funny after. I was 16 years old when I was arrested in Center Camp, and I was too young to really realize what the situation was. I was deported with a big amount of my family: my mother, my father, an uncle, and a, a, a sister with her husband and two kids. They all went to the gas chambers. Out of 13 of my immediate family, I'm the only one who came back. For the 10 minutes that I work, or 15 minutes that I sang, they forgot who they were, and that was the most important thing. And that's what made me being alive. Now, the first camp, when we entertained the SS, they didn't come. We only entertained for the inmate. But the second camp, why the SS came to see us, all, all I can deduct then is like uh, they had such a terrible life hitting us and killing us that they want to be entertained too. The camps, in certain cases, had a cabaret, but they would never put on anything that, that mentioned gas chambers or the mass murder squads. It was subversive by nature, but you had to be very careful how you did it. So the SS guards who came would not understand that they were the ones who were being spoken about. It's the kind of humor that'll make you cry. Really, the underpinning is sadness. I was in the cabin. And it was very funny, very witty. Of course, people were laughing. People were laughing and talking about it next morning. And how did you like so and so? Of course, well, we imagine that we live in a normal time. There was a song which we have adopted as our anthem. It went something like, let's join hands, we shall overcome. When the tyranny ends, we shall all dance on the ruins of Terezin. Well, sadly, very few would have been able to do so. Okay, so we know there was a Holocaust humor by the victims in the ghettos and the concentration camp. And we, from the film, we understand the controversy about Holocaust humor afterwards. What about quantity? I mean, we know that nowadays with the world of social media, there are tons of Holocaust humor memes on the internet and it goes around. And what do you think about that? What about um, quantity, which has no sometimes has no context, just, you know, memes thrown here and there in the internet. Well, I think that's when, that's when it starts to get a little more dangerous because it's in more people's hands. It's, you know, um, you know, it can spread, it can spread amongst haters. At the same time, I mean, I remember, you know, this keeps changing and evolving. I mean, if you can imagine, I had this idea years before there, you know, as the internet was just beginning. I remember um, while I was making the film, I mean, I, I touch upon him a little bit, but the, uh, the French African comedian, uh, uh, pardon my bad French, but 
Fujine, you know? He, That's uh, the way I pronounce it. <laughs> I wouldn't know either. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, it was like the big fear had that he, he was growing hate and, and it was very localized. And I used to think, oh, you know, someone like that, you know, takes to the internet and, and it could become worldwide. And I was, I remember being very nervous about that. And then the, the memes became a thing after that. So, which spread even faster. So I do think that that's an issue. And, you know, on the other hand, I, this could be just something I tell myself, but we see imagery now that we didn't before, or we see proof of anti-Semitism that we didn't see before. So it's a balance, right? So the, the, the haters are getting that material, but you know, it's also opening the minds of other people to see that this exists. And, you know, it's interesting because Joan Rivers and Sarah Silverman, they talk about, you know, at least telling these jokes. It's a form of storytelling really. And it, it's keeping, you know, Joan Rivers is like, this is keeping it alive. It's keeping, and I, and I do think that there's something to that, but, but, you know, we are living in a time where there is a lot of hate and it's, and it's spreading like wildfire. So, you know, you have to be careful. You have, and like, again, it's all about context and, you know, and I do think it's an issue. And in this world we live in, uh, how were the responses to the film? I mean, when we talk about context, you, you show the film all over. So I guess you can spot some cultural differences between the places. I'd be happy if you can share some stories. Sure, sure. Well, I would just say that overall, my, the response to the film has been it pretty incredible. It is very, very rare that I have had anybody upset about the film. I think because, you know, we did it, we always, we always sort of open up the film with, you know, we, we did a film about bad taste, but we think we did it in good taste. And I think that that's true. I mean, I think that Renee, nobody tells the story better than Renee. You know, here she is a woman that, you know, she's not a comedian, but she's somebody with a sense of humor and a sense of light and who, you know, um, brings that to the film and stuff. So, you know, but, but um, so th there have been honestly less, th less than a handful of people who have wanted to, you know, who've been upset and angry. In terms of the cultural responses, there have, there's been a big, you know, it's different culturally. So, uh, you know, we, we premiered in the spring of 2016 at Tribeca. It's, it's New York City, you know, it's, um, you know, um, it was a perfect New York City, you know, that was the perfect audience, you know, Mel Brooks humor, all, you know, did very well. And then the, the, our European premiere, so we went right from there to Munich, which was sort of the sort of heart and soul of Nazism. So, um, but I, you know, I didn't know what the response was going to be, although I had had a, a an inkling because we had this intern working for us. My, my producer had an intern working in her office and we were, we were at the stage, we were getting ready for the premiere and we had to watch down, we had to have, you know, him watch it down for, you know, any glitches from the post house. So he's watching, she's in the office with him. I was doing other things and I kept checking in with her and she said, well, so far no glitches, but he's not laughing. And, you know, you know, 20 minutes later, I text her, like, anything now? She's like, still, not a peep. I'm like, that's odd. He was the first person that didn't work on the film or who wasn't invited to, like, a screening to give us notes that had ever seen it. So we were, like, nervous. Anyway, he finishes the film, and she said, well, what did you think? He said, I loved it. And she said, really? Because you didn't laugh once. He said, I'm Austrian. I'm not allowed to laugh at those jokes. And I thought, oh, okay. So we did, it didn't even occur to us. So when I was going to Germany though, I wondered would that be the case? So I got, we go to Germany and the very first of two screenings, there's about 350, 400 people in the audience and there's not a, a sound. But the difference is, I mean, I'm in the room with all these people and you could feel the tension of holding back laughter. Like, I mean, not, not, not like literally, but it just felt tense, like there was not gonna be laughter. However, in the moments where they weren't Holocaust jokes, but they were jokes about Jewish stereotypes, 
that energy of holding back humor, they laughed too much. You know, it was like, like roaring with laughter. And that was upsetting, right? I thought, okay, you, you, you're not allowed to laugh at Holocaust jokes, but you're fine to laugh at a joke that makes fun of Jewish people. That, that didn't feel okay to me as the only Jewish person in this room of almost 400 people. Anyway, so I go and do the Q&A. He's the, the, the pro head programmer who was a friend of ours because he's, we've had four films at, at the Munich Film Festival. He brought me on stage and it turned out to be just a conversation with him and me because the, nobody left. They all wanted to be at the Q&A, but nobody wanted to ask a question. And it was, you know, we, so we tried to talk about it a little and whatever. So then the next day I had, a, I was telling the story to some of the programmers as I was getting ready for the next screening. And it just so happened that one of the programmers was Jewish. She lived in Berlin, from Berlin. And I told her the story, not realizing she was Jewish. And she said, oh, I'm going to plant myself in the audience and ask about the cultural differences. So she did the, like the Q and A stuff. So she thought it would be two things. It would make me, give me a excuse to bring that up, but also break their silence. Like if they thought someone from the audience then it was okay to ask questions. So she raised her hand and uh, said to me, she said, oh, what are the cultural differences? You know, it must be different New York, Munich. And I, I went on to tell the story of how I was there yesterday and I noticed that nobody was laughing and it made me very uncomfortable that they thought it was okay to laugh at the anti-Semitic jokes that just weren't Holocaust related. And then we had a whole interesting conversation come out of that. So that was pretty incredible. Then a week later, I, the film went to Israel. I was at the Jerusalem Film Festival. So it was like, I got, I, right in a row, I, I got it all out. So, and that was very different too. And also, of course, I knew that there was a history of Holocaust humor in Israel. And I also knew it was very different than American Holocaust humor, but I knew about it. And had this been a series, there would have been a whole episode that would have been on the Holocaust humor in Israel. You know, I just, I couldn't afford it. I couldn't, you know, but, um, and Edgar Carrot, who I'm also probably mispronouncing his name, who I love and is in the film. He was in the audience with me and at the Q and A. So that was a, so our, our first screening there was at the Cinematheque. It was a very international crowd, very academic crowd, and it went, went well. But I didn't really get a sense of how Israelis felt about the film. But the second night, it was in a progressive Orthodox neighborhood. I know you, you, you may want to translate what I call progressive Orthodox. Yeah, and yeah. So, uh, and in, and that was a very, very different experience. And I, we had the Q and A and there was one woman, only one, she was unhappy about stuff. We continued the Q and A in the lobby for another half hour. We talked, I answered all of her questions and she said, oh, hey, I feel better now. So, but, so those were my, that was me being thrown into how people would react to the film. <laughs> Great. So we talked about a lot about Rene tonight, and I, I think we should watch uh, clip number eight. Uh, yeah. So we can just, yeah. you know, end with Rene and her perspective on life, and maybe afterwards you can say a couple of words about uh, the star of the film. Okay. You can't control how your joke will be inferred, you know? Did you enjoy that? Uh, I like to hear the song, but I could not enjoy it. Why not? With an Italian singing a beautiful song. Uh, because I remember for so many 
youngsters who were perished and they can't enjoy this beautiful place. But you know, and, you survive, you're alive. How can you not have pleasure out of the fact that you survive? Always I remember the children screaming, the selection. You know, that is like an our shadow. You cannot in forget. No, no, you no, cannot, no. You cannot live in the shadow of, the, of those cries. You have to remember it, but you cannot live in those shadows. I don't live in the shadow, but the shadow is following me all my life. You know, I speak about the Holocaust all the time, but I enjoy life. I am so happy that I have three great-grandchildren. Could, could Hitler imagine that I will survive and have three great-grandchildren? I mean, that's my revenge. Rene was with you in uh, some of the couple of times you showed the film to answer the Q&A. Yeah. So how did she respond to the responses? <laughs> well, um, Renee is an incredibly special person. I noticed someone in the chat asked if she's still alive. She is indeed alive. She lives in Los Angeles. She turned 96 on Holocaust Remembrance Day or the day after. Um, she she's an incredibly special special light and for a couple of years after the film came out we were traveling with the films together we were actually in montana for this one screening and we a couple answers it that really struck me were you know every time i watch it with her because of her age she was um she has new memories you know, it's sparking memories that, you know, sh are way deep beyond. And so somebody said, how can you find this funny? And she said, well, you know, you know, humor is a, it's a natural instinct, you know, and if something is funny, you laugh. And um, she told, then went on to tell this story that she had never told me that there was a guard, a woman guard who came up to them in their barracks and started you know, screaming at them and being really awful and walked away, dropped her gun and tripped over it. And they all started laughing. And she's like, that's that, you know, it wasn't, you know, it was that kind of humor where it's like a release. And then somebody else said, you know, well, what, what did you think when she first asked you? And she said, she said, at first I thought Fern was crazy. And then she would think back and, and remember these stories and, um, and, you know, well, they might not have been funny at the time, but looking back, uh, you know, like she tells a story that we didn't get to show people about the, the tonsils, for instance. And, um, you know, so she started to remember these things and, and wanted to talk about it. And then now that she's seen the film, she went on to say that she feels like it's the only Holocaust film about yeah. Yeah. Does anybody else see that? About the humanity of the Holocaust, because only if you're human can you laugh. So when she said that, that really, you know, moved me. Thank you very much, Fern. It was amazing talking to you, and thank you very much for letting us know everything about behind the scenes of this <laughs> important film. And now uh, back to you, Madin, for questions and answers. You're on mute. You need to unmute yourself. I, I, somebody has to help me to get unmuted. <laughs> okay, first of all, thank you. Uh, Fern and Liat, uh, you guys have been a couple in my head for a few months, and I'm so glad, maybe even a few years, actually, uh, because of uh, Liat's books and because of Fern's movie. I just saw a natural click, and I'm so glad that um, we had a chance to have you carry on this conversation. I think you both deal with this uh, subject so well, so beautifully, so I suggest for everyone First of all, I put a link in for uh, Fern's, the, the movie's website, but also to read Liat's books, those that can read in Hebrew. 
it's a gift. And those can that want to read in English, there's also books available in English. Um, and so um, before I continue with questions, there was a question about educational programming. Uh, Fern, if your uh, movie is used in Israeli educational programs, um, I don't know, right? We don't know. We'd, we'd like to have no, no, that no. happen. I mean, it, we, it is used in programming all over the world. I right. do educational programs in Germany and Israel and whenever. And if anybody is ever interested, you can find me on my website or you can find me through Medine. Um, I am happy to do any programs, you know, and, and, and the conversation gets ever more relevant with, you know, what's going on. And even, I mean, there was a New York Times article that uh, came out in the beginning of COVID, for instance, just talking about how we deal with humor and crisis and, right. you know, like, and again, it's the same question as opposed to, you know, can you make, you can't make jokes, you can make jokes about the Nazis, but you can't make jokes about, um, about the victims. It's the same thing. People were making jokes about quarantine and, you know, remote learning, but they weren't making jokes about, you know, the people who were dying. So it's just an ever relevant topic of conversation that I would be happy to talk to anybody about doing some yeah. sorts of program. Absolutely. I mean, uh, seriously, uh, it's become as relevant as it was when it came out four years ago. Um, I'll start with some of the questions that we have from our uh, audience. Um, actually, someone's asking, it's been a few years since the movie came out and uh, someone is asking if there was anything that you would change in the film today. No, I'm very <laughs> happy with the film. I'm very happy with how it came out and I'm, I'm happy with the response. I will say this, I take that back. Um, I was supposed to interview Chris Rock. Who's not the first person that comes to mind, but uh, he got involved in, you know, he had a divorce and he was, you know, had to go to court and we had to finish the film and it didn't work out to do the interview. And I do think that that might have been something to, like I always had plans to open it up to other topics, other type of topics, which is something I'm actually working on a film right now as my follow-up film. But um, I do think that that might have told other audiences outside of the Jewish community that, you know, this is something to be seen by the whole world, you know? And I, I think in some cases it, it is, but it's, people don't always realize it is until they've seen it. Does that make sense? And people still have an opportunity. Uh, some people are asking in the chat about seeing the film. Everyone who is participating tonight got an email with the confirmation. And in that confirmation letter, there was also a link to Vimeo and a password. So if anyone is still wanting to see the movie or if they have difficulty finding that link, you can write to me and I will help you. No problem. But also beyond, beyond the next yes. 24 hours, you know, it, it, it's on iTunes, which should be all over the world. Right. And it's on Amazon Prime. Exactly. So, and again, if anybody is interested in seeing it, if anybody is considering it for any kind of program, you can write me personally. Um, I can even in the chat put my, or if you could put my email in the chat, if anybody wanted to write me directly, you know, okay. I'm happy well, to talk. If about I can it. do that. Meanwhile, I just want to go on to one of the a question, a uh, very interesting question. Uh, so this person is asking, one can argue that the use of humor does some sort of, and I'm going to try to say it with my list, I said it because I can't say it, to me, the, use the aesthetic aspect <laughs> to the Holocaust, that irrespective of the underlying moral reservations can help draw new and more diverse audiences to the topic. Do you agree? And if so, how do you think that could be done? Well, that's exactly what I was just talking about right. with the Chris Rock answer. I mean, but again, the film I'm working on now sort of goes beyond like, okay, I made this film from within my community. What happens if we talk about this stuff outside of it? And for my next film, I've actually partnered with a black director so that we can ask these questions together. So I'm not, you know, so like we can, you know, have these conversations both in the film and, and sort of behind the scenes. 
Um, I mean, in the, in the movie, I know you do have uh, Edgar Keret uh, as the representative <laughs> of Israeli humor, but I think this is a question for both Liat and Fern together. Someone is asking about the difference between American and Israeli Holocaust humor, which I think is a very interesting question because I remember the first time we started uh, talking about it in the museum. I've been at the museum for 20 years. We had a, a seminar about this, but I worked with Holocaust survivors. They were always joking. Yes. So well, they were talking about how they joked during the Holocaust. So for me, it was like, oh, oh yeah. Right. So my question is- well, I, Can I take the yeah, first part and then I'm, I'm gonna yeah. give it over to Leah. So um, I, I think that one of the main differences and Edgar would always say this, like everybody, you know, in Israel, there, are, there were survivors everywhere. Right. I mean, I grew up in a very Jewish community and I didn't know any survivors. I was, came from a Russian Jewish community, you know? Um, it, it just wasn't part of even my upbringing, even though I learned about the Holocaust. Um, so, so that led to a, a different layer of it. Now, another thing is, and this is sort of one of the questions that Liat asked me, you know, about people's responses. One of the biggest surprises for me was I was so nervous to talk to survivors about this film for obvious reasons. I didn't want to offend anybody. I didn't know if they would believe me that they, you know, that, that I would, they could trust me with their stories. But what I hadn't, what I hadn't counted on is after I made this film, so many survivors came to me, like, or would come, mm -hmm. at, at, like, with stories or family members who had, you know, a survivor grandparent or parent. And because there was not a venue to tell the stories about humor before. So suddenly, I mean, you know, I, I also regret that I don't have some sort of way to, you know, include these stories that people were giving me because I think that it was, it was a really nice thing for people to be able to share their stories where before they were sort of very private within their own families. But I, to, more to the point, I think Liat, you might know more about the I think it's great. specific differences of the kinds of humor. Yeah, um, again, it's a great question because there are many differences. Uh, for example, in my opinion, Israel is a unique sphere of Holocaust awareness and you cannot compare Holocaust humor in Israel in which we live and breathe the Holocaust to Holocaust humor in the United States or in Europe. Uh, in Israel, you can find it everywhere. You can find it on Twitter, you can find it on Instagram, you can find it on the way people uh, talk about their daily lives, uh, what they do, the way they're afraid of knocking at the door, they're not sure if it's the uh, pizza or the SS and something like that. And I mean young people who are in their 20s, their 30s, this is the way that they explain their lives because again, it's so enrooted with our identity. You don't find it in other places. And I've recently just wrote an article about Anne Frank humor in Israel, right. comparing it to the Anne Frank humor in the United States. And in my opinion, outside of Israel, people are more concerned with slaughtering the sacred cow. I mean, you cannot tell it and we must say it. In Israel, it is much more profound because it's so rooted within our identity. You can find Holocaust humor that deals with political uh, situations, with ethnic situations, with daily life situations, with the acting out of the Holocaust in Israel daily life and so on. And outside what I see, you can't find sometimes other topics, but mostly it's we cannot say anything about it and we must laugh about it and we feel so cool about it. In Israel, we've passed this, this uh, topic. We're much more, our, our humor, in my opinion, first of all, is much funnier, deeper, and touches on so many subjects that you cannot find in other places. By the way, in Germany, for instance, they let themselves laugh a lot, but about the Nazis, because laughing about the Nazis, in a way, differentiates between the present, the Germany right. of the present, and what happened in the past. So laughing about the Nazis is great for everyone, but they don't dare laughing about the victims. In Israel, is you know, Everything is open, everything is free. And again, the humor is first better and funnier and much, much deeper. You can find mm -hmm. tons, of, tons of examples in my articles and in my book. Yes, for sure. Actually, there's an interesting question here and it connects back to the movie. Um, and once again, before I ask the question, before we say goodbye, there are still people who are not 
understanding how they can get the link to the movie. There are two ways. First of all, if you have, you have an email with a confirmation with a link and a password to see the movie and you have until, if you're in Israel until tomorrow morning and if you're in the States until tonight, uh, this evening. And if you have difficulty, please write to me, to my email. My email is in the confirmation letter and I will help you find that. Secondly, you can go to iTunes and to, uh, it's a Prime, right? For Amazon. Amazon uh, Prime. And, and, I also, and I just added my uh, last laugh email for anybody right. who can't get it for where they live and I can help right. you find it. Right, because that's one of the problems and that's why we had the movie with Hebrew uh, <laughs> subtitles because it wasn't available in uh, Israel. There is a question about uh, life is beautiful and did you think about uh, interviewing uh, Roberto Benini? And I have to say, I was not expecting the, the, the comedians like Mel Brooks to actually not accept his, his work. And I don't see him as a, a comic, right. I see him as a, right. so it'd be very interesting right. to get your. Yeah, well, I did try to get Roberto Benini, but I, I couldn't get him. Um, you know, I mean, it's so hard with these films because, you know, it has so much to do with timing and money and whatever. Like we were supposed to film Art Spiegelman and then there was that Hurricane Sandy and it didn't work out timing anymore. And then he, you know, that, that shook him up a bit and he didn't want to then talk about it anymore. You know what I mean? Like, so timing and when we have money and you know, would we have had to go to Italy for one interview? So, but, but we, we couldn't get him. We would have loved to have had him. Um, and to answer your other question. Um, I was just saying that I was surprised that comedians. Oh, like, oh, oh. what I was going to say is I do feel like, I feel, bad. <laughs> I feel bad about that because I find that there are two groups of people in the world that don't like that movie. One is Holocaust survivors and the other is comedians. And I think that the comedians don't like it because it's, it feels a little schlocky to them. Hmm. And so I've no, I, there are no comedians that I've met that like that film. Really? It's so interesting because the, the who is it that was, was talking about, the, he's from the, um, one of the committees for Holocaust survivors. He's for, I called it a generation oh, and a half. Abe he said, yeah. I absolutely understand the movie. I absolutely understand right. everything that parents... And he's, a, you know, a child of survivors. So I was surprised, too. We did not yeah. see that coming. And the whole crew, while he was telling the story, we were crying. It was a I very know. moving story. But, you know, yeah. it just, it touched him in a way. And, you know, maybe it was his seal of approval that got that film on the map. Because, you know, he was the head of the ADL and you know, his word meant a right. lot. Absolutely. Um, I think uh, at this point, uh, I'm just gonna see if there's any other question. Actually, this is very interesting. I don't know what your next project is. And, and Liat, also, I think this may be a very good question for you, uh, but someone's asking if, if you've done any uh, systematic look at some of the video testimonies from survivors. And he writes, I, my experience is that many include anecdotes that lead them to serious laughter. I watched a Theresean survivor tell a story involving a coffin that it was hilarious. Um, I'd like to add that there's definitely a culture of gallows humor um, at the uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington that is incredibly therapeutic. So if you'd like to, maybe we'll use that as the last question. Very nice. Um, you know, as I said, I would love, and I've always been trying to figure out a way to have sort of a collection of these these stories and stuff and and then you know in my mind it would then open up to other other survivors of genocides and you know just just how humor really you know existed in all these stories and so I do know that those existed in, in a lot of that because while I was doing the years of research people would tell me oh I was watching one and uh, you got to watch this one so there were so many and I had I not found Renee who was telling me her stories directly, I probably would have dug into that to fill in that space, but I was lucky to have Renee, who, you know, you know, has her own t testimony as well. So, um, but I am aware of that. And that, that's exactly what I was saying. Like people, 
it, it was so much more prevalent than we realized because to laugh is human and we all, we all do it, whether it's nervous, whether it's, you know, um, you know, healing for all these different reasons. And so it doesn't deny how absolutely horrific the experience might have been. There still might have been a moment where you had a smile or a, like mm -hmm. a breath. So I, I, I can leave it on that. Okay, Liat, you want yeah. to add something? Yeah, in my opinion, it's a very important defense mechanism, which we mm -hmm. avoided for so many years because it was a taboo. And we couldn't say that laughing about the Holocaust has this therapeutic aspect, but it does. So besides Friends film, which is brilliant, I also recommend an Israeli film titled Pizza in Auschwitz. And uh, the protagonist is Danny Hanoch, which I love dearly, and is a Holocaust survivor who made a, a conscious decision in Auschwitz-Birkenau as a child that he's right there and then he stops crying and from there on he just uses black humor and he transferred it like he inherited it to his daughter and the film follows both of them uh, while they travel across Europe and they use this awful awful gallows humor which a Holocaust survivor and his daughter use in order to defend their souls and there's also a very interesting story in another film titled Choice and Destiny, another excellent film in which um, the director's father tells this horrible story about the way they were asked to work outside the camp and then they forgot them outside the camp and they, he and his friends beg to get into the camp and he tells it and he laughs the entire story. And this is a horrible story. And his daughter is telling him, what, you asked the, the camp guard to let you in? And he said, yeah, because we didn't have anywhere to go. And he laughs all the way through. And I think this is a great example of what humor is as a defense mechanism. So yeah, Pizza and Auschwitz. And just uh, another quick word. I see uh, Gabby Finder is in the audience. And we love Gabby. And he's one of the editors of Laughter After. So if you're interested oh, in a wonderful. <laughs> great book. So here is, uh, here is the link Thank to you. everyone for uh, Laughter After. Yes. Uh, well, I read two chapters and I'm waiting to order it <laughs> <laughs> so I can continue reading because Liat's and Fern's chapters were incredible. There was so much we could talk just about how you write those two articles and how relevant it is today. There is, you know, I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out on a limb. There is one more question. Uh, Beverly A. Chalmers, who I respect as a researcher and she deals with uh, childhood and women during the Holocaust, she does have one question. And I think it's an interesting question. She says, the ending is one of the most moving and sad moments of any film I have ever seen. Why did you choose this ending for a film about humor in the Holocaust? And that way I think we can probably end. And thank you, Beverly, for the question. It's such an incredible story. I mean, talk about things that happen for a reason. So um, we there is a scene where we film with Renee. It, we are in Las Vegas at a Holocaust sort of yeah. reunion, you know, and uh, at, a, at the Venice uh, casino and uh, I was actually supposed to interview somebody else on the gondola. It was supposed to be an interview and last minute, uh, the person who it was supposed to be was like, I, I don't wanna do it. So Renee says, I'll do it. <laughs> and she said, let's, let's get, she had the idea of bringing Ellie Gross, mm -hmm. who is a complete, completely opposite of her in terms of how she, she saw no possibility for humor. She, um, they, they just are like, you know, night and day. And so I said, oh, that would, that would be, you know, of course, Ellie was a lovely woman and wanted to be a part of it. She just, and, and is not afraid to talk about not thinking there was any humor. And so we have them on the gondola together. And so I don't know if any of you have been to the gondola ride inside the casino in Las Vegas, but it's like a ride basically. So we had to arrange three rides where we did the interview, you know, once around, twice around, and then they would leave and I went once without them to get the shots they're not in so I could edit it. So, you know, we talked to the, to the gondolier and said, listen, we're gonna be talking to them. Can you wait to sing so that it doesn't interfere with the conversation? And, you know, 
or or let's start with you singing and then they're going to talk and we'll signal you if you should sing again. <laughs> so he starts, he sings Volare. It was wonderful. They start talking. It was just a, a magical moment in every way. And then out of the blue, while they're talking and having a very serious conversation about something, he starts singing O oh, Solo Mio. He's, I can't, we can't, we're like, it's not a good time. You know, everyone, my camera assistant's on the boat with me. Like the sound, my sound man is doing sound alongside the canal, sort of walking along with us. So he can keep the, you know, he has to be close enough that he doesn't lose the, the transmission. Anyway, so, so we're like, it's gonna, you know, it was just a weird thing. And then anyway, we kind of, he finished and then we had to have him retell the story and then the ride ended and it was a little awkward moment. So they get off the boat. Oh no, we stop the boat. The boat stops and, and the song ends and Renee looks at Ellie and says, you know, I have that song was playing all the time when I was, you know, in the war. And I, you know, I, whatever, you know, I, oh, no, 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 that's, she didn't give that away. She said, you know, I have a story about that song, whatever. This was my, one of my earliest shoots. They get off the boat and I can't hear them anymore. But in my mind, I'm like, this is the fundraising trailer. And we're going to end with her saying, you know, I have a funny story about this. And my idea is like, and if you pay money to, you know, if you give us money to finish this film, you'll find out that story. But I didn't think anything of it, right? And I am so overwhelmed with all these other things. And then we're going around to get this stuff. And from, from the, you know, it's basically in a mall, right? So my sound guy is screaming, get, oh, solo video, because they get off the boat and they still have their microphones on and she goes on to tell the story that Renee tells at the end of the movie. I don't know this story. I don't know that randomly that's, that song was told. Okay, so, and I forget that I got the song like my sound man told me, but he never remembered to tell me why. Like, oh, there's a really great story attached. So I didn't know. So I... Uh, that was December, and I didn't see Renee again until we filmed in March. And I, in the meantime, edited this fundraising trailer, and I put it to this beautiful version of O Solo Mio, just, just because I thought, oh, that's, that's just a pretty thing. And I ended it in that way, like I said. So as, as is not surprising, we were filming with Renee in her house, She's working hard with all the shoots. And then afterwards, insists on making the whole crew lunch. She's making us lunch and then we're eating it and she's not going to eat with us. And she, I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll have you, I, I can show you the trailer. So she's sitting at her computer on the other side of the room and we're eating. And I'm, I'm looking to see if she likes it, you know, like her response. And all of a sudden I see her starting to get choked up and cry. And I... I, she doesn't let, you know, if she, she doesn't let that side out a lot. Mm -hmm. So I walked over and I asked her and she tells me the story then. I didn't know. And then I said, is it okay if we film this? And I turned it on and it was her watching the trailer that, 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 that story came out. Now, how bizarre that, that, that she was in the gondola, that he played this song. But I, you know, to me, that is like just one of those beautiful, beautiful moments. And intimate, absolutely yeah. intimate. And, yeah. really and the power of cinema, of course. <laughs> the power of cinema, absolutely. Okay, women, <laughs> once again, I wanna thank you both for really making a dream come true for me, <laughs> but also for the work that you have done in the research and, and bringing it out in, in medium that we can all share and understand. Um, I want to thank our audience um, for coming to be with us and some of you again and again and again. Thank you for your questions that were incredible. And we invite you to come visit us again on December 6th. We have two more programs in December and then we're off to 2021. And I want to invite everybody to enjoy our upcoming programming. So, toda, toda, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Shalom. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.